know, we're very fortunate to have Craig Burnett with us. Uh, he is a engi structural engineer. I have or a back. I actually have a degree in aeronautical engineering. Aeronautical engineer. Okay. Well, these engineers are usually smart guys coming out of school, <laughs> and you know, as I. So anyway, he's uh, engineering background, and he broke off from uh, I guess Boa Builders was it uh, yeah. a couple of years ago and started his own company to uh, and is doing very very well. So we're real pleased that he's able to come in. And you know, my goal today is just to give you a little, not get into the minutia of you know the, the crazy structure and things like that because what I what I want to do is give you a, enough knowledge to be able to walk through a house with your client and look at something and say that's not a big deal that's a big deal this is gonna cost about X this is gonna you know this is gonna cost about Y things like that so what I've done is I've kind of broken the you know, the, the presentation into two sections. The first is going to be the actual anatomy of a house, and we'll, we'll go through everything, foundation framing, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, all the structural elements. Then we'll just talk a little bit about the trades. Um, insulation and drywall, there's not really a lot that you can say about insulation and drywall. And then we'll go through some of the interior finishes, and again, what to, what to look for that's a red flag throughout the whole you know, throughout the whole process. And then we'll go through the exterior finishes, the windows, doors, siding, masonry, roofing, all that kind of stuff. And then after that, we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, basic replacement pricing, just so you guys can know. And again, it's, it, there are a lot of ranges involved here because it depends, obviously, you guys know, depends on the zip code, depends on what the neighborhood is doing, you know, the style of the house and everything like that, but we'll talk a little bit about the, how much a kitchen is going to cost to to pull and replace or to redo master bathrooms, secondary bathrooms, um, finished basements, and you guys probably may already, you know, know a lot of this. Uh, and I apologize if I go through it all, and I kind of repeat things that that you've heard in the industry. Um, but again, code changes, cost change, things like that all the time. And what I usually tell all my clients is, whatever you have in your head. For, for the price, double it, and you're close. Okay, especially with homeowners, they've got they've got these these crazy wild ideas that they can get a, a you know upscale kitchen for twenty five thousand um, dollars. And obviously, then we'll go through the exteriors, windows, uh, entry systems, which are just you know doors, front door systems, siding and masonry, roofing, and then some of the trades. Again. Hot water heaters really are all we can see. When we're walking through a house and everything's finished, you're not going to start cutting holes in, in the drywall and looking at the drains and things. You're turning on sinks and looking underneath to make sure that they're not, they're not leaking, but you're really looking at the hot water heater and things like that. And the electrical panels and such. Okay? Please, if you have any questions, instead of a Q&A session at the end, just fire them at me while, while it's fresh in your mind. I don't mind. I, I, it doesn't bother me. I actually prefer that. Get a little bit of interaction. Keep everybody awake. I usually bring a lot of chocolate, but I had it in my truck yesterday and forgot to take it out. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, my kids don't mind. They're just going to break it up. Okay, so now we'll start with foundations and not the typical foundations that, most, that a lot of people think about. Although my wife would love to have those kind of options. Um, the old, you know, back in the day, I grew up in a house that, that was built in 1680. And it's still standing. It's one of the, the five oldest privately owned residences in the nation. Um, and it's on a stacked stone type of a foundation. There we go. Um, stacked stone back you know, prior to, uh, you know, 1900, that's about all you found. And they were great as long as they lasted the first 20 years because the house is going to sell. But once it reaches a certain point, everything's nice and compact and things like that. Um, my house had a 34-foot main living room. I could stand at one end and the ceiling was here. I stood at the other end and I couldn't touch the ceiling. <laughs> it was like this. But it was still, it, it, yeah, I mean... The, the stories that I could send a chimney colonial with a, with a uh, escape kind of a secret um, staircase that went up around, and they had a little six by six room in brick 
that was built as part of the chimney. We used it as a wood box. There was a, there was a um, fireplace in every room. That's how we heated the house in the winter. And that little thing was, de was designed so if it got attacked, Native Americans or, you know, and they burned the house down, what's the only thing left standing? You run up there, you survive the heat and the smoke, and you come down all, all, all good. Like yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. A a, a, a 17th century panic room. Yeah. Um, but, you know, these, and again, you're going to run into a lot of these stack stone foundations in Arlington and, and Alexandria, some, some of the older, older, older houses. It's fine. You know, what, it is what it is. You're not going to, you, you can't change it. You really can't find it. If there are any problems with it, the only thing you can do is tear the house down, okay, because you can't repair those kinds of things. The block... Um, so if there's a, if it's structurally not sound on one wall, you. you have to just it's well no, it depends on the, the it, it depends on the extent of the damage. I mean there are ways you can go in there and and reinforce with steel I beams and and jack the house back up and things like that. But at that point, if there's a lot of structural damage or the house is obviously listening to one side or something like that, I would almost walk I would I would turn to my client and say. I'm calling an engineer before we even walk in the house, because it could be a fifty or seventy or eight ninety thousand dollar repair, depending on how bad it is. Okay, it can be done, but unless it unless the, it's the perfect house for your perfect client, it may it's probably a, a case of well we're either walking away or do you like the dirt? Are we going to build build those and just and bulldoze and, and rebuild? Okay. Um, with the brick block, again, it's the old, the old style. They really didn't fill it. They didn't reinforce it with rebar or anything like that. If you, if you got the guys to throw some stones down in there and maybe throw some mortar in there, you were lucky. Um, but the, you know, just the, the way that the block, because it's hollow, um, it's not nearly as structurally sound. And then you've got all kinds of hydrostatic pressure and, and things like that from the soil that are, that are pushing... Um, you know, on the walls, we saw it in a in a house down in in Woodbridge, cracking on the walls. And there are, if it's if it's major, again, you can repair it. You can go in with uh, composite straps and strap the whole wall together, and and actually bore into the bore back into the soil and and put an anchor in the soil, almost like a, a ship anchor, to pull it back. So that's like 50s, 60s. Yes, absolutely. Because okay. old in Vienna, old part of Vienna, mm -hmm. I sold a house like during the Crazy Town time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, their whole entire left wall had collapsed, but they they just rebuilt the whole thing. It cost yeah. like fifty five thousand dollars. So what we did was we just put all the paperwork out on the table and said this happened, but mm -hmm. it's fixed now, mm -hmm. and we still had eight offers. But it right. was expensive. Yeah, very very really expensive. expensive. Very you know by the time you get into engineers and and dealing with the county and inspectors and uh, yeah. you know all that kind of stuff, it's very expensive. Okay. Um, now, all the foundations are, not all of them, but 98% of the foundations that you see are poured concrete. Um, you know, what they do is they, they dig for footers and then reinforce the footers with some rebar. Then the, you have the poured concrete walls. Um, always have to have anchor bolts. And these anchor bolts up here, actually, you drill holes in the top plate, the piece of wood that sits on top of this, uh, of the foundation. You drill holes in it. And then you fit it right over the anchor bolt, so actually the the wall is anchored to the foundation. Okay, so you don't just build it on top, so it won't sway, and it's it's actually all structurally sound. And then they even even with concrete slabs that they have to be reinforced with wire mesh as well. Um, so, bottom line with something like this is the if it's if it's undisturbed, these foundations will last. Dot dot dot. Okay. The concrete now is is it's usually four four to five thousand psi concrete, um, which is it hardens to an incredible, absolutely incredible strength, and they'll last as long as the building is going. The, the, you know the building itself is going to last. Okay, the things that um, that and that's obviously now what foundations look like. See this over dig, mm -hmm. so. That's the, keep that in the back of your mind because we'll talk about that a little bit later. But typically, if you've got a 50 by 60 foundation, they've got to dig it 60 by 70 in order to allow the guys to get in there and, and set the forms and all that kind of stuff. It's called overdig, and it causes some 
problems later on. Okay, we'll talk about that later. If you don't have a good foundation, those are a couple of things that can happen. Obviously, this was on the outer bank somewhere or somewhere on the coast that was just sitting on, on hook, probably six by six posts. Now, decks, I don't know, the code changed again. For, and this is just to kind of throw it out there. Um, as of uh, January 1st, 2015, we can no longer build decks with six by six posts. They have to be eight by eights. And is that a county, new county code? Yeah, well, the, the, the county follows IATA, and so it's, it's supposed to be a nationwide code, but yes, in Fairfax County. Um, so now if you've got a 14-foot deck off the, off the ground, we've got to get 20-foot 8 by 8s and nine guys to carry the thing. <laughs> There's, it's getting crazy. It's getting so over-engineered, but it's, we're in such a litigious society that, uh, you know, better to... Is that, that a state not. code or a county? Or county? It's, go, it's, it's a national code. It will, it's, it, as of January 1st, it's a national code. Because okay. Fairfax County, I base everything off of Fairfax County because they're nuts. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they are. Worse, right? they, yeah. Um, so anytime I walk in and there's a change, they, they base their, all their changes off of national code. Okay, so it's not something that they just kind of arbitrarily come up with just for Fairfax, and then you go into Arlington or you go into Loudoun, and it's different. Okay, everybody's code is going to change. So, um, the eight by eight mm -hmm. is that for? Decks it's for that your structural posts. Supports. Your structural the the, the posts that the, the that the house had, the legs that they that that the deck actually okay. sits on. And from somebody that has carried six by twelve foot six by sixes. I'm not doing the 8 by 8s That's why I hire people. <laughs> I'll help out to a certain point. I'm 42, not 22. Um, so some possible causes of, of the foundation failure, and this is very, this is, um, applies very much to that, the block foundation. Less to concrete if it's done right. The biggest, the, the biggest, um, you know, uh, risks to the concrete are, uh, believe it or not, tree roots, which can cause the plumbing leaks because the trees are looking for your water, okay? Yeah. So they can actually get into a water supply line and not only mess up, you know, get your uh, water bill to go sky high, then they, the excess water that's leaking out of the, where their, the penetrations degrades the soil, which causes the, the foundation to, to shift, okay? So it's kind of a snowball type of an effect. Um, drainage, very, 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 very important. I hate gutters. They are a necessary evil. Get the water as far. If you run into somebody, a, a house and they have the downspouts that just spit right next to a the foundation, red flag number one, okay? Get, them, get that water away from the foundation as far as you can. Bury a line and get it to the property line. Have a pop vent, get it up to, near the streets, anything. I have a, a house that um, the owner recently got, like Thompson Creek gutters or something mm -hmm. like that. And on one of the um, paid out the nose for those things. Right, one of the gutters on the front of the house. So like, there was one that they like stopped where a downspout would be. Like there was mm -hmm. a downspout and they took it off. And then, like now there's one downspout over here and then one downspout over here. Right. But. They didn't bear, like you said, bury that thing. And when she had asked them, like, aren't you guys supposed, isn't there supposed to be a downspout there? They're like, no, that like kills the warranty or something like that. Or we're not allowed to put, we're not allowed to put that. Um, I'm not, I guess, Mike, hold on. I'm not sure the other, pr the practices of other companies. <laughs> um, so typically, in a gutter installation, the biggest thing is, and just, after about a 25 foot run of gutter, you need a second downspout, okay? Because what happens is the, the pitch becomes too slight for the water and the debris and everything to, to run, okay? So what happens is you're gonna get dirt, you're gonna get leaves, you're gonna get pollen, holy moly, the pollen strands, okay? So after about 25 feet, if, what happens is if you've got a downspout on this side, you set the gutter at the highest point of the fascia board, Okay, this is a fascia board. And then if you only have a six inch fascia board, which most 
houses have, you literally, over 25 feet, you have six inches of drop. Make sense? Okay. So after 25 or 30 feet, what you do is you set the high point in the center. And you have two downspouts. Okay. So now if it's 30 or 35 feet, you've got a high point in the center. So this half of the roof, the water, goes this way. This half goes this way. And it's, it's pitched enough to get some of the dirt and the debris and the junk to go into the downspouts. Six-inch gutters for everybody. Oversized gutters, oversized downspouts. The, the cost is about, a, it's an extra dollar a foot to go with the big ones. Never, ever, ever put, re, never re recommend five-inch gutters. Okay? Absolutely. And the other thing that I kind of, and this is 100% this is personal choice, I never do gutter screens or gutter covers because you're going to have to clean the things out anyway. It's going to have to happen. And like a Thompson Creek or a gutter helmet or, or you know, gutter gizmo, they, what they do is they'll still, allow, under certain conditions, they'll still allow the pollen strands and it gives the homeowner a false sense of security. Oh, I never have to clean my gutters again. Well, then everything backs up and, and stops draining and you're getting Niagara Falls over the front and they're freaking out. And nobody can touch it except Thompson Creek or Gutter Gizmo, or right. and they charge you another thousand dollars to come out, take take the things down, take the covers off, and clean them out. Hire a company like Stronghold or like <laughs> Ned Stevens. Everybody sees the the, the Ned, the, Stevens. Ned yeah. Stevens. When I was living in Arlington, I had a contract with them. It's very very easy to sit, set up. Well, this was okay. Holy moly, I just got dizzy. Eighteen years ago, <laughs> <laughs> um, I. Set it up, they came out once in the fall and once in the spring. And I literally would walk home and see all the junk on the ground, and it was fine, just take it and chuck it out. And, I, and an invoice would show up three days later for 75 bucks or whatever it was. Right. Hire somebody to clean the gutters out. Don't waste your time on the gutter screens because all it does is, even if you do it yourself, it triples your work. You gotta take the screen out, which is only two feet, scoop that, put it back in, mess up the, the roof shingles because they have to slide under the roof shingles. Now the roof shingles do all, all do this down at the edge. Put it back and then go to the next one. Just get up on the roof with a blower and. What do you think of leaf guard gutters? Um, same thing. Say that again, Don't, not worth the money. Just leaf guard gutters. Not oh. worth the money. They, I install, I, I install a, it's called Leaf Away. It's the best one that I've found, but it's so flipping expensive that I explain to people, okay, if we do six inch gutters, it'll cost you twenty five hundred dollars. But if we do the leaf away, it'll cost you 7200 Now, take that money, figure that you're going to have the, break it down. Spend $100 twice a year to have your gutters cleaned. It's $200 a year. How many years can you have gutter cleaning for that five grand? Okay, I'm a very, being the engineer, I'm a very bottom line, analytical kind of, kind of person. So when I explain it like that, Unless I have a client that turns and says, I never have to worry about it ever again. But Okay, fine. No more. That we'll, we'll get it done for you. Right. right. But what if you break it down. Leaf away? It's called Leaf Away. What yep. are they? It's, it's a... It's just covers? It's, it's actually all one piece. The gutter, the cover, everything is one piece. And they actually, my guys, manufacture them right in the driveway. That's the just like with Leaf Guard, too. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's the same thing. Um, but again, my... The cost benefit analysis for me comes into play and it's just not worth it. You know, 10 years worth of gutter cleaning is going to cost you, yeah, you know, two grand or you can spend five grand for the, for the leaf away. I'll do it if you want. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. I'll take your money. Extra zeros in the check. I like that. But, you know, I've talked myself out of more projects than, <laughs> than I like to, you know, I like to admit. Um, so. This is exactly what happened down in Woodbridge with Kate. Um, if they're, they, they weren't anywhere near as, as that bad, the cracks that, that we ran into. Um, if they're really minor, the, it's normal settling. But if they're, if they're more than a quarter inch or so, there might be some, you know, some structural issues. But also, the other thing that can happen is a house is built, but then they, have, they build an addition. Okay? Just because the house, the soil where the house was sitting is solid at the, at the footer doesn't mean that 30 feet away it's the same conditions. So especially in the old days, now everything's inspected allegedly, and I've got a great 
another great story for you. But, um, you know, they just decide, okay, we're going to add a couple bedrooms in the bathroom over here, and the homeowner does it or his cousin does it or something like that, and the soil isn't, isn't as good. So the, the addition actually starts pulling away from the house, okay? Some signs that you can, um, you know, that that's happening is ver non-vertical chimneys, the masonry's cracking, okay? You, you, cracking on a, on, a, on a mortar line is, is okay for a certain distance, but if it goes three-quarters of the way across a, a wall, there are some serious issues, okay? At that point, you just turn to your client and say, that's, that's bad, or it could be bad. Let's get an engineer, let's get somebody in here to, to really evaluate it before we make any decisions, okay? Um, Craig, I'm sorry, can we go back to that other picture? Absolutely. So you showed in that other picture, stair step. Yep, crack. yep. Um, the same thing applies for you know, a horizontal crack straight across, you know, or is it just if it's horizontal and bulging? You don't see, see a lot, in the block foundations, mm -hmm. you don't see a lot of straight horizontal cracks unless it's way up high or way down low because all the blocks are staggered. Well, they're supposed to be staggered. <laughs> Depends who built it. Okay, so that's see how the, the center of this, the center of this block is the edge of this block. Okay, so very very rarely because the weight is dist distributed that way, very rarely do you see anything that goes straight across unless it's the slab, which sometimes the, the basement slab is actually settling, but the wall's good, so it, there's a there's a straight horizontal crack at the bottom, or say the same thing up top is for a section that section of footer is is moving to, at the same time and it's just cracked that whole thing. So very, very rarely do you, do you see something like that. Yeah, um, you do. <laughs> call somebody, call me. I mean, and, and that, that's the thing. If, if, if you're ever in a situation, this is, if you're ever, ever in a situation where, you know, my little cracks, tiny cracks are fine. If they get to be an eighth, a quarter, something like that in a foundation, that's when you're getting some serious, and spider webbing is almost as bad you'll see next to a drain, cracks going away from the drain. That means that it wasn't, it, that may not be a foundation issue, that's a slab issue. But when they put the drain in, the soil around it and everything wasn't compacted correctly. So unless you, you can't fix that, you have to take everything out, get the, inject concrete underneath it, and you know, re-pour the slab. You know, there are some serious, you know, there are some issues that can get very, very, very expensive very quickly. So okay. sometimes you see those, uh, and I, it's not a hairline obviously, but you mm -hmm. see them down on the slab itself, mm -hmm. but they're about an eighth of an inch and you see them coming out actually mm -hmm. away from the wall. So I don't mm -hmm. know, is that generally an indication of water or the, settling in water? The house is going to set. Right. There's nothing that you can do about it, no matter what. Um, and, is, and is an eighth of, is it an eighth important? I mean, a quarter of an inch, I'm like a little bit concerned about, but is an eighth? I would something? have anything more than an eighth. Okay. I would have somebody come look at. Okay. Again, you know, it's one of those things where it, settling cracks and things like they're going to happen. You, unless you're borrowing 50 feet into the ground to bedrock, bedrock, you're living in Oregon somewhere, and you're pouring these massive, you know, concrete columns and everything, that's the only, that's the only time that it's not going to settle. Okay, but it's a good thing that for you to turn and say, "Listen, that crack over there. Don't worry about that. This is the one that I'm worried about." Right. And again, it's all about the knowledge that you're gonna you're gonna show to your client. Like, holy moly, she knew what the heck she was talking about. She pointed that thing out. My the other two that I've that I've walked through with didn't even look at it. Kind of thing. Okay. Question on the stair steps. Mm -hmm. Is is the concern there more about the width of those and the length? Because, I mean, I, my understanding is stair steps weren't that bad a, a thing. They're not. The width concerns me because, again, the length, once, once mortar starts, starts cracking, it's just going to keep going. Okay? The width is because that's a, it's a separation. Things are starting to expand too much. Okay? Whether, it's, whether it's lengthwise or whether it's the, the hydrostatic pressure pushing on the outside and actually causing it to bow. Okay? Um, that's when you start to get concerned. Yeah, because okay. I went on a listing appointment where they, they had a number of cracking issues. Mm -hmm. And if you stood up against the wall and looked, I mean, you could see the wall was bowing. That's mm -hmm. when you start to, and that's, yeah. Yeah. what am I doing standing in this house right now? Pretty much. This is a concern. That can be corrected. Mm -hmm. 
expensive. Yeah, well, we actually uh, had a neighbor that did not address it, and they were really lucky that their son was not in that part of the basement when the wall collapsed. Yeah. Wow. You see. He happened to be in another part of the basement, mm -hmm. but and they were really, really lucky. I saw one the other day where it was actually a, a, like a sunken patio off the back of a house, mm -hmm. and the, the brick wall was bowing, and he, he, the homeowner recognizes that there are some serious issues and he wants it replaced. And I went to met, and I said, I'm not going, I'm not walking anywhere near that thing. Because with my luck, it'll collapse right on my head. Just a question. Mm -hmm. Let's say that that's, mm -hmm. you know, the real house we're talking about. Right. And it's not tipping over like that. It's just got a crack. Mm -hmm. um, I had one where they said that it needed like seven or eight footers. Because mm -hmm. they had put an addition with a crawl space. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being just needing like one. And it was really just to pacify the buyer. If just a guesstimate, how many, what would you think you'd have to do about that exact situation? Like, would you put footers in? Would you re Can I ask a question? Yeah. Who, to, who told you you needed seven or eight? The home inspector for the buyer. Yeah. I had the listing. Okay. Um, we actually got an engineer come in. Yeah, that's the, the smartest thing to do. You're going to get conflicting reports. You've got to get an independent yeah. that you're going to pay 500 bucks to or $1,000 to. $1,000, but it was worth yeah. it because it saved her $35,000 because they took x-rays of the floor. They yeah. dug in next to the house. They said, you don't need that many, and luckily the buyer was mm -hmm. okay with that. The guys that I work with, that's, and I literally tell them, good, good news, bad news, I don't care. Just, and and there, there are engineers out there that work for, that only work exclusively for certain companies and things like that, and they're a little bit biased. It's almost like the expert psychological um, <laughs> you know, witness the at, the, at the Pistorius trial, you know, kind of thing. Do you think that a footer is the solution to that, or would you have yeah. to repour the whole foundation? No, you couldn't repour the, the whole foundation. Okay. Like, you have to jack it up. Yeah, you have to jack it up. Once, once it, it's actually, if you try to repour an entire foundation under a house or anything, it's, it's not cheaper just to knock the thing down okay. and start. It, that's, yeah. But you, there are ways that, it's, it's called concrete injection. You can actually jackhammer things. Um, you know, raise it up, support it, take out the bad set, some bad sections, and inject concrete down below. Once you hit, but you have to get a soil engineer that says, okay, you've got to go another three feet, six feet, twelve feet until you hit solid ground. Then you have to get somebody get in there with a the ditch witch and dig the footers, dig the holes, inject the concrete, and then you let the, the house back down. So it's a really, really, really involved process. What what effect would would the would that situation have if it's on the outside wall of the basement steps going down? So you have the basement steps, and to the right is the foundation of the house. To the left is that. What? So okay. it's just bowing, but it's only bowing out towards the steps. Would is that eventually because of the cement <laughs> steps eventually reach to the foundation of the house? No, it's or is it contained just that outside completely wall? separate. Okay, completely separate entity. Uh, what's happening is if it's in a corner or something like that and there's right. a down there's usually a downspout there or some kind of gutter something funky going on all the water's getting right there has nowhere to go because the foundation there's a big kind of L in the foundation and then you have the steps so all that water just sits there and it just pushes on the on the on the uh, on the wall it happens a lot right mm -hmm. happens a lot um, you know that's why now they're using poured concrete walls even for the even for the walkouts, reinforced just like the foundations. Okay. Good. Questions. That one's a problem. Well, pretty good foundation. It's a couple thousand years <laughs> old. Yeah. 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 It's not bad. So, um, when you're talking about a solid concrete foundation, a V crack is something to be concerned about, right? That's what I've heard. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and again, there are so many issues that can affect the concrete itself. Um, temperature is one. If you're pouring concrete in the middle of the summer, you have X no depending on, on what type of concrete you're using. If it's 4,000 PSI, if it's 5,000 PSI, if it's 2,500 PSI. They actually, they literally, in the truck, fill the truck and start a stopwatch. You have 60 minutes to pour that concrete. Otherwise, it's gone at a certain temperature. Okay? So, some people, most people, I hope, pay attention to that. You know, if they didn't, if it was an hour and the guy gets stuck on the beltway and an hour and 25 minutes later they're pouring the concrete, because when it comes out, it still looks the same, it still it acts the same, but the structure, it's no longer 5,000 PSI, it's 2,200. And those, the, those um, tolerances and that integrity is based on the size of the structure and the loads and all that kind of stuff. You know, something like that, a V-crack will show up 
probably within the first, before they get everything framed. You know, you get a certain amount of weight on it and things start to disintegrate. But V-cracks, if they're, if they're spider webs or V-cracks, absolutely. Holy moly, yeah, just, that's when you time out, we're calling a structural engineer, we're not messing with this thing. Little, you know, settling cracks and stuff. You'll, and common sense at that point kind of kicks in too, you know. Good? Thanks. Um, I got one more quick story about foundations and I know we're running away. But, oh my God, this was during the boom. I was, I, I went on a, uh, a, a deck lead out off of West Ox Road. A guy wanted to build a deck on this brand new McMansion, like year old. Okay, bye bye. And he turns and he says, do you know anything about settling cracks? And I said, sure. I grew up in a house that was built 300 years ago. There were cracks everywhere. And he says, okay, can, can you come inside? And I'm expecting, you know, three inches off of a doorway here or there. Walk in, there are four foot settling cracks off of every door, cased openings. You know, it's a two-story foyer you, you, off the corner leading from the kitchen to the dining room. You know, you know what I mean? Wow. Let me see your basement. We walk down into the basement, okay, poured slab, lolly columns, right, the metal, mm -hmm. metal posts mm -hmm. with expo what are called exposed footers. You have, before you, um, you pour concrete in the holes that the columns go down into, an inspector has to come over, okay, that looks good, go ahead and pour it. Nobody had poured the concrete yet. I walk over to one, the column stops about maybe a foot short of the soil. Brick pavers. Brick pavers. Eleven. Eleven posts. Held, the whole house was being held up by brick pavers. Interior. Exterior walls were fine, right? But all the interior walls, so everything was going like this. I, I called a buddy at, at at the uh, where was that at? Off of West Ox Road, kind of near. Um, Can you say who the builder? I, I honestly I don't remember because the, the house was a year, almost two years old. Which you know the, the structural um, items are usually covered for about between five and ten years, depending on the builder. Was it the pool piece on the right hand side, right before you? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was. It was near the. Well, it was. It was near the hospital. Yeah. Um, it was actually north of the hospital on West Ox Road on the right-hand side. Okay. I can picture the house perfectly. Really? So I called the I called my buddy at the at the county and said, Jim, this just happened. What's going on? And come to find out, at the time they had something ridiculous like 4,200 projects going on and nine building inspectors. Wow. So, you know, that's the independent inspectors are great. <laughs> you know, if you have to rely on the county, sometimes if, if they're too busy or something like that, now it's better. They've got 22 or 23, but they're going to go through a massive yeah. retirement here. They, they um, hold up just, lots of stuff because you have yeah. to wait for them to inspect. Exactly. Every day. We did like a porch deck yep. thing, and they, had, they came like eight times. And every single mm -hmm. time we had to wait three or four days yeah. for them to come, even though we let them know. Americode. Okay. Write that down. Americode is a great independent building inspection company. And they, the best part about it is, you say, I want an inspection Tuesday at 3 o'clock. They'll be there Tuesday at 3. America. 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 Right. And they're engineers. Uh, they're building inspectors. Inspector. They're building, they're building inspectors. inspectors. Right. So if you don't want to wait, or you can't wait, or you call the county, because the county will come out, if you have questions about a house, you can call the that already exists, and you're looking to walk, you're walking through it with a client, but you can call the county, and they'll send an inspector out to look at things. I mean, obviously, if it's already finished, you can only look at certain things. Um, but you could, they, they provide that service, but you're going to wait a week. And they will, the county will abide by AmeriCo's decision? Yes. Like, okay. Yeah. yeah so they're, like they've got all the certifications and everything. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. They'll sign off on it. Okay? Good to know. Good. Moving on to framing. Mm -hmm.